Lakeshore. Stay standing for a moment if you would. Look at you for a second. The Bible says that we enter his gates with thanksgiving and we enter his courts with praise. So I just wonder if we could take a moment and just express our gratitude to God. How many of you tonight just thankful for Jesus, first of all, that he saved you, changed you? Come on, some of you, he's healed you, set you free. Can you just give him tonight the very best you've given him all night? Oh, I said the very best you've... You would do better for the Cowboys than you did right there. Can you give Jesus the very best? Come on, he's worthy. You can have a seat. I'm excited to be with you. I'm happy you thankful for your church. Wow, that was weak. I think only the paid people said amen. How many of you are thankful for your church? You got high class problems. Not every church is needing more parking lots and buildings and spaces. You should be grateful to God that He's moving. You know, you could have high class problems or you know, when the engine goes out on your Mercedes, I don't feel bad for you. You got a high, like when your hot tub's broke. Sorry, you got high class problems. And uh, everybody's got problems. I'd rather have high class ones, right? And, uh, you know, great churches aren't built on the talents of a few, but the sacrifice of a lot of people. And, um, but it does take a leader to lead a church. And uh, 29 years of faithfulness to the house of God. What a gift you have. And Pastor Brad and his wife, Denise. Come on, can we honor the leaders of this house? What an incredible gift. Well, you ready for the word of God? Well, let's get in it. That clock is counting fast backwards. Acts chapter 12. Uh, I just want to read verse 5 to start with. And uh, bring you greetings from the great state of Virginia. And uh, got my passport stamped. I came into the nation of Texas. And uh, it was real entry. It was easy. My visa was good. Everything went well. I'm kidding. And, uh, but it's great to be here. We're having a great time in Virginia. I bring greetings on behalf of my wife, Tammy, and all four of our kids. And uh, I, I don't love kids that much, but I like her a lot, evidently. And, <laughs> Some of y'all get that later. That's how all those kids got here. And, uh, but we're happy to be here. Acts chapter 12, verse 5 says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. We're going to park on that verse. I'm going to read it to you one more time. It says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. If you're the note-taking type, I want you to write this title down. And even if you're not the note-taking type, go ahead and write this title down. Uh, we're going to talk about when the church prays. It's power when the church prays. So let's pray right now. Father, um, we open our hearts and minds to you. We ask you to speak to us. We haven't come to do some religious ritual. We've come that we'll hear from heaven tonight. And so Holy Spirit, speak and uh, change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. How many of you ever faced a setback of some sort in your life? Show of hands, you faced a setback. Some of you haven't. That's amazing. We'd love to hear your secrets to not having setbacks in life. Can you please write a book? It'll be a bestseller. I remember uh, one, uh, one of the first like, real remembrances I have of a major setback in life was uh, middle school. Just all three years, everybody. It was just, I'm kidding. It wasn't all three years, but it felt like it. Um, can I get a better amen from any middle school? Okay. Um, so it was eighth grade. I grew up in East Tennessee, in uh, Kingsport, Tennessee, to be exact. Um, if you've ever been there, um, you know that the men are men and so are the women. And I'm kidding. If you're from Tennessee, forgive me. God bless you. We love you. Um, the real pastor will be back Sunday. So... Um, Anyways, I grew up in Upper East Tennessee, and the only thing you do in Tennessee, it's kind of like Texas, is football. That's it. Friday nights are football, Thursday nights are football, and then Saturday is the other UT. It's orange and white football. That's it. And when I grew up, there was no Titans, so there's no Sunday football. You didn't care about pros. Nobody cared about pros in Tennessee. And uh, um, they, they do in Virginia, but we still don't have a team. They call them the Commanders, but they're from a local high school. And so, <laughs> anyways... 
that's how I feel about them. So anyways, that's all you did. So, but Friday night football, and Virginia doesn't understand this, but for us, Friday night football was 15, 20,000 fans at high school. And then afterwards, you had a dance. That's just what you did. And there was nothing else to do in the town. We had like a cheeseburger joint and Friday night football and then a dance afterwards. So you follow me? I grew up in a very, very traditional Baptist home. And so you didn't dance. You, you didn't have premarital sex because it led to dancing. <laughs> That's how against dancing we were. Are y'all tracking? Some of y'all have not smiled at me yet. I'll get you before the night's over. That was funny. I don't care who you are. That led to dancing. And so we didn't dance. But for some reason, I got into this dance. I don't know if my parents had amnesia. I don't know. I'm the third kid if they just gave up by then, which now that I have three, I think that's kind of what happened. Um, by four, you're like, where are they? And so I somehow I ended up in this dance, which was really more of a standoff. It was all the guys on one wall, all the girls on another wall. And I finally got up the courage to go over and ask a girl that I had a crush on to dance. And because a slow song was on, I was like, this is my only chance because I have no moves. I got no rhythm, and so there was no chance I was doing one of those upbeat songs. So I was like, this is my moment. I walked all the way across the gym, longest walk of my life up to that point, and um, I, I make the request. All the guys are watching me. All the girls now are watching, and she kindly rejects me. Thank you for this empathy. Counseling solved it. But So I make the long walk back, and you know I get beat to death by all the guys like, because of this major setback and it for me it, it you know obviously it scarred me I'm talking about it 30 years later <laughs> major setback and we've all faced setbacks in life right and and some of them are as funny as a middle school dance in reflection but a lot of them are can be painful can they not the setback may be a financial disaster that happened in your life major setback could be you went through a broken marriage major setback um, everything was going up in the right direction and then you got the diagnosis, major setback. Maybe a friendship was like, you, you dialed in, you had this friend and then you got betrayed or stabbed in the back, major setback. Maybe you were applying for the job, hoping for the promotion and you got overlooked again, major setback, right? You didn't get into the school you wanted to go to, major setback. We've all faced setbacks in our life and some are humorous and some are painful, are they not? And the text we just read, you may not know it, is the New Testament church facing a major setback. They're facing a major setback. Let me give you a little bit of history. Can we go to Sunday school for a minute if we can say amen? amen. All right, the more you talk to me, the better I preach. All right, so if you leave and say that wasn't good, it's not my fault. So <laughs> it's your fault. And so real quick is what happened. Whenever Jesus was born, King Herod was in charge. If you remember that, say yes. Okay, so this is King Herod's grandson, King Agrippa I, okay? So this is, we're, we're a little past Jesus' time, and now this new thing called the church, this fledgling entity that's just sprung up on the scene, and, and man, it's growing at, at an incredible rate, and um, that is amazing, and everything is going up and to the right from Acts chapter one to two to three, and I mean, just like, 3,000 added to the church and baptized and, and numbers were added to them every day. I mean, just the move of God was happening. It was spreading along Jerusalem, Judea. They were taking the gospel, you know, just all kinds of wonderful things are happening in the church. But in the middle of this, the growth of the church is a threat to the current culture. It is a threat to the current society of the day. And we have a hard time getting our mind around this in 21st century America, but the Jewish culture wasn't just cultural, it was governmental, it was all woven throughout everything that they did. So the first five books of the Torah were not just what they read, it is how they governed and the laws of the land. Are y'all tracking with me? So now we have this movement called Christianity that is growing, these followers of Christ, and now they don't keep the Sabbath like the Jewish people do. And now they don't follow the eating customs like everybody else in the culture, and they're living counter to the culture, and it is threatening those in power. And when those in power get threatened, they want to keep power. And so King Herod Agrippa I, we're back to him, decides that he will, he will kill James. This isn't James, the half-brother of Jesus. This is James of James and John. If you're tracking, say amen. Are y'all with me? 
We're gonna go somewhere. I'm just wanting to lay the groundwork for you. You should read your Bible. It's fascinating. And so what happens is he goes, I'll kill James. And that earned him favor with the Jewish people because King Herod Agrippa was kind of an illegitimate king because to really be a king of the, of the Jewish people, you needed to be born Jew, but he wasn't born Jew. He just married a Jewish woman. To, so to curry favor with the people, he was doing anything they would to keep them happy. If you're with me, say amen. So he kills James and he sees, man, that got me a lot of favor. So now I'm going to imprison people, Peter. And this is where we enter Acts chapter 12, verse five. And it says, Peter was kept in prison, but the church was praying to God for him. Peter was in prison, a major setback. And we'll go on to read in the text in a moment that he, he imprisoned him uh, during a, a Jewish festival. So he wouldn't put him on trial during that which was really be a kangaroo kind of court where they would convict him and murder him. But this is the night before that. So the next morning, this is what happened. And the Bible says that the church was praying. I think this is a fascinating statement to me. I've thought about this verse a lot because if it were us today, and, and I would say for myself that whenever a setback hits, my first response isn't always prayer. The Bible says that Peter was kept in prison, but... The church was praying. Peter was kept in prison in the context of James just being murdered. Peter most likely going to be murdered. So the two major leaders of this movement in the church, the head is about to be chopped off. What is going to happen to the church? We get a little diagnosed. We get a little bad news. Somebody emails us. We don't like what they said. And all of a sudden we're like, oh God, where are you? They're about to face one of the biggest setbacks in the beginning of this thing called the church. And it said they went to praying. The church was a contradiction to what we normally, our flesh, would want to do. We get the bad news and we, it would read more like this, and I don't think any of us would blame them. Peter's kept in prison and the church was worrying. Peter was kept in prison and the church was scattering. Peter was kept in prison and the church was trying to appeal to the mayor to see if he could change the thing, if he could manipulate it. Peter was kept in prison and they put a GoFundMe on Facebook to see if they could raise enough money. Hello, somebody. See if they could raise enough money to pay off some guard to see if they would sneak Peter out the back door. But the Bible says Peter was kept in prison and the church went to praying. The church was a walking contradiction. I wonder if we wouldn't have more influence in the world that we live in if our lives were walking contradictions. How would it change your work environment if when you got that diagnosis and everybody knew about it, you walked into the office the next day going, I don't understand it, but I've got a peace that passes understanding that fills my heart and mind in Christ. Would a world around us go, but you shouldn't be acting that way. You should be depressed. You should be hiding in a closet somewhere. Maybe if we were walking contradictions to what everybody else would respond in that situation, but it says they went to praying, which tells me something. They believed prayer was powerful. And I know as Christians, we say prayer is powerful because it sounds right. But more often than not, we say, I've done all I know to do. Now I guess I'll pray. But they believed something about prayer. They believed that prayer was effective. That they believed that prayer had the ability to change things. That they believed that, that more than going to King Herod, more than going to a Roman guard, more than trying to manipulate the situation or network their way into something or buy their way out of something. They believed that if they would talk to God, that God would move on their behalf in the middle of their circumstance and actually change it. There was something about this New Testament church that actually believed that the super of God could break into the natural of us and do something supernatural in our lives that our eyes haven't seen and our ears haven't heard, that our mind can't even comprehend. There was something about them that actually believed that our God is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask, think, or imagine. There was something about them. They believed prayer was effective because they said that instead of scattering, instead of running, instead of worrying, they went to God in prayer. 
I want to point out to you that they went to God. They didn't go to their mom and them. Hello. They didn't go get the opinions of everybody at school. They didn't put a Facebook poll out. They didn't put a TikTok up and get everybody to respond with what they think they ought to do about the situation. They went straight to God in prayer because they believed prayer was effective and prayer is effective. If anything, I wanna remind you and stir something in you for that thing you've quit praying about for that situation that you think is too far gone, for that circumstance that you think, no, God isn't gonna turn that around, for that job issue that you think God couldn't solve that, let me tell you, God can move mountains and God can move people. God can move on the hearts of men and women. God can orchestrate. God could remove your boss today, put a new one in the place. That was, Some of you are like, yes, Lord, that word is for me. <laughs> because prayer is, is powerful. And here's why, because prayer brings you into agreement with God. Agreement is a powerful thing. Do you know that? Do you know that? Okay, I'm just, are y'all awake still? Agreement is a powerful thing. Matthew says, right, that wherever two or three agree and touch on anything, there God is and there he hears and answers and responds to their prayers. And not, that prayer, prayer, that agreement, prayer brings us into agreement with God. So the more I pray, and the more I pray the will of God, the more of my heart comes into alignment with the will of God and the word of God, and I come in agreement. And when I come in agreement, there is power. That word agreement there has the idea of symphony. It has the idea of, of all, all the instruments together, though, though we be different instruments. I know that's not great grammar, but it's what I'm trying to convey. Although we are all different instruments in this room, are you following me? There, there's something about whenever we in a symphony begin to lift our voice in agreement to God in prayer, he goes, oh, I show up there. Oh, I move there. Oh, I start, I start arranging things there. I start moving on behalf of those kind of people. This is why the enemy loves nothing more than division. Hello. Because the Bible says that where there is unity, God commands a blessing. He doesn't just maybe send one. No, he commands a blessing to come on you. So the inverse would be true as well, that where there is disunity. And disunity doesn't mean I don't like you and I'm fighting with you. It just means I am not in symphony. I am off pitch. I am out of alignment. It's when your car just drifts to the right a little bit. It doesn't mean your car doesn't work. It just needs to be dialed in. Are y'all tracking with me? And so prayer brings me into agreement, but the problem with a lot of us is we have come into agreement with everything but what God has said. Hello. We come into agreement with all kinds of things except what, so we begin to agree with what the enemy has spoken over our life, or we begin to agree with just what this is. Here's how I know. We say things like this, well, it just is what it is. Well, who told you that? We say things like, there's nothing we can do to change it. So, so you've come into agreement with a doomsday negative outlook on everything. You've come into agreement and, and what you're agreeing with is what you're getting. What you're agreeing with is what you're receiving. And we, and we come into agreement. We say things like this, and I don't, I'm not trying to be insensitive, but we say things like, my anxiety. Who said it was yours? You've come into agreement with something that God never meant for, it may be a reality. Are you following me? I'm not talking about ignoring reality. I'm talking about living by faith. That it may be something that is real in my life and something that is affecting my life, but what I'm going to come into agreement with is that as I submit my request unto God, the peace of God that passes, that's what I'm, God, I'm coming into agreement with your word tells me that your peace that passes all understanding, hello, somebody help me, will fill my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That's what I'm coming into agreement. I'm not ignoring reality. I'm not just speaking positive things. I'm coming into agreement with the word of God. I can't see the path before me right now, but I come into agreement that the plans you have for me are to prosper me and not to harm me, to give me a hope and a future. That is what I'm agreeing with. 
Hello. And some of us tonight need to break agreements with things. You've agreed with what your ex spoke over you. And that's what you're getting. You've agreed with what someone declared over you, some negative thing. You agreed, you agreed with what the narrative in your mind began to tell you about some situation that you were in. I'll never bounce anything. I'll never get beyond this. I'll never move past this. And you've agreed with that and settled in. And you are living less than the inheritance that God has for you as a child of the living God. Because you've come into agreement with some things. And you've just, that's, well, that's just the way my family is. That may be the way they were. But it doesn't have to be the way that you are. Hello, child of the almighty God. Can I get a better amen in the house of God? <laughs> Prayer brings you into agreement. It says they prayed earnestly to God. The word earnestly there, the Greek word Luke, Dr. Luke, who wrote Acts and Luke, you know, you could kind of read them as one combined narrative. He only uses that word one other time, the Greek word for earnestly, which the New Testament was written in. And the other time he uses is whenever he describes how Jesus prayed in the garden on the night that he was betrayed. Great drops of blood came, right? Y'all remember that passage? It's the only other time he uses that word. So it expresses the passionate plea of their prayer. Can I tell you something? Passion in your prayer is not a personality. Well, I'm, not, I'm just not, it's not my personality. It's not my personality to be passionate. It's not about personality, it's about desperation. You get desperate enough for something, which I'm always amazed at people that are like, well, I'm just not expressive in worship. And I'm not, you know, I'm, you do you, boo, right? <laughs> but if I find out the thing you love, I can get you pretty expressive about it because all I got to do is attack it. And if I attack the thing you love, all of a sudden some expression comes out of you because we express love naturally because we're humans. We're wired to worship. And so this idea of earnestly praying has nothing to do with the personality, has everything to do with the level of desperation we have for God to move. The Bible says they were in this room, they were together, and they were earnestly praying to God for Peter because he was in prison and most likely dying the next morning. Now, here's the interesting thing. Is that the church, are y'all still with me? Okay, the church would not have had to pray earnestly if Peter had not been in prison. So it was the pain of prison that got the church praying on a level they'd never prayed on before. And so it's actually the resistance of the situation, the setback was actually the thing that developed something in them that they had not developed in them before. Because nowhere between Acts chapter one and Acts chapter 12 do we see the church praying like this. And I'm not saying God sent Herod Agrippa the first to get Peter and to put him in prison, but I'm saying that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Our youngest is four years old. His name's Jonas and he's, he's a whole vibe, y'all. He's got this like curly hair and um, he's, he's a whole thing. He's gonna be a heartbreaker. He's a trip. And, um, but whenever he was adopted, five days old, he came to us um, and came three weeks earlier than we thought he was coming. So literally we got a call at lunch at noon and said, hey, the baby Jonas has been born. He'll be at your house at eight o'clock tonight. Do you have a name? They didn't say baby Jonas. We were like, uh, yes, Jonas. <laughs> no, we already knew. So, but in utero, he had something called a torticollis, which is where this neck muscle kind of tightens up and, and it kind of causes them to tilt like this, which makes them lay like that, which makes the back of their head go flat on one side. And so thankfully our pediatrician called it really early on. And so he had to go to the children's hospital and he had to go through all this physical therapy and they put this little like pantyhose sock over his head and they had to do this 360 around um, camera thing. And then they gave him one of those baby helmets. You know what I'm talking about? And you know, good parents like get them painted and print them. We didn't do any of that. 
because he's the fourth child. And we were like, he's the fourth child. We ain't got time for all that. <laughs> I'm kidding. We just believed in Jesus' name. It wouldn't be on there long enough to need it. Anyways. And so, uh, so anyways, what that helmet did, though, is that it would create uh, pressure on certain parts of his skull and not pressure on certain parts so that it would shape out to a nice round head. And so every time we went up there, the styrofoam inside of that helmet, they would shave out. They would shave out certain sections. And they knew because the measurements they took every two weeks, what part of the helmet to shave out to make sure the pressure was on the right part and there was no pressure on the other part so that this little skull would begin to form a nice round head. Are y'all following me? I think sometimes in life, God thinks we're schizophrenic. Because we come into an environment like this and we're worshiping and we're like, God, use me and God, do something through my life. And then life happens. Some of you even know life happens. Setback happens. You get turned down for a dance. Hello, somebody. Major things happen. <laughs> life happens. And God's like, oh, good. I can use that pressure on you right now to develop something in you that you could not have had developed without the pressure. And then we come back in here and go, God, where are you? And you forgot about me. And God's like, wait, last first Wednesday, you wanted to be used by me. I thought you really wanted to be used. But for you to be used, there's some things I need to do in you to prepare you for what is coming because you serve a God that is not inside of time. All right, we're getting somewhere now. You serve a God that is outside of time. So he saw the day you were born and the day you would die at the same time. So he knows you're from beginning to the end and your end to the beginning. So he understands what is coming tomorrow and next week and the next week. And he knows what you will face a month from now and two months from now. And because he is a kind and a loving God, he will prepare you and tool you and strengthen you and build your character. So when you step into that thing, you are ready for it. But a lot of times we eject or we abort it because what happens is God begins to use pressure like that that little helmet and go, no, no, I got to shave a little bit out here and I'm going to use this work situation and I'm going to use that friendship drama and I'm going to use that little pain in your life right now. But if you'll allow me, it won't confine you, but it'll refine something in you and I will build some character in you and I'll build a muscle of faith in you that you would not have got otherwise. It was the pain of Peter being in prison that caused them to pray. Can I tell you, on the other side of pressure is greater faith. Has anybody walked through something that goes, what the devil meant for evil in my life, God turned it for good. I wonder if anybody on this Wednesday has a testimony that God turns it for good in your life. It was the pain of prison that sent them to praying. And I would propose that without the pain of prison, they may not have prayed like that. It says they prayed to God earnestly for him. Let's keep reading in the story. Verse six, it says, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him. He said, quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrist. And then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. I don't think, just so you know, Peter wasn't laying there naked. They had inner and outer garments. <laughs> just saving that mental picture for you there. <laughs> So Peter did so, wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. And Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. So Peter's in that state between awake and asleep. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody that's had a toddler, you know that. When they walk in your room, they say nothing. <laughs> they stand by your bed and you start casting out demons. <laughs> They're gonna need a small group in therapy. That's where Peter was. You're like half asleep and you're like, dear God, get away. Oh, oh, hi, baby girl. Come on, get in the bed. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. It says they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened uh, for them by itself and they went through it and they'd walked the length of one street. Suddenly the angel left him. The angel's like, I'm out. Got you far enough, buddy. 
Um, then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent this angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating because they were anticipating him getting killed. And when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Now we have no indication that he knew they were praying. There was no, no carrier pigeon, no email went out, no, no mass prayer chain went out. Nobody was like posting, hey, everybody's at Mary's house tonight. We're all praying for Peter. So that had to be a regular gathering point. It had to be a like, oh, that's where they would be. And so Peter knocked at the outer entrance and his servant girl Rhoda came to answer the door and when she recognized Peter's voice, she never opened it, she heard his voice. She was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. <laughs> and here's what these great people of faith, I love how honest the Bible is, you are out of your mind. They're earnestly praying to God for Peter. God does the miracle and they go, not possible. <laughs> Is that not us? But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. I wonder if God's like, I wish you wouldn't be so amazed whenever I do what I say I'll do. I wish you would just be grateful. Peter motioned with his hands for them to be quiet and describe how the Lord brought him out. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. He's like, make sure Jesus' half-brother knows what's going on. All right, that's the worship team. They come help me out. So we'll land this plane. And you know when the keyboard comes, the Holy Spirit shows up. <laughs> Little preacher hack, that's how it happens. Um, so Peter is stuck between two guards. He's chained between two guards. And then there's gate, gate. Like he's locked down. And the Bible says that he's sleeping. He's sleeping. No Xanax. <laughs> no NyQuil. He's sleeping. He's at peace knowing he may die the next morning. I just wonder if Peter knew something that we should know is that the God that was with him on the day of Pentecost when he preached and 3,000 people came to faith in Christ is the same God that was with him in the cell. But I don't know that he was sleeping because he knew God was with him in the cell. I think maybe he was sleeping because God was already at the trial the next day. Because we serve a God that is outside of time. And what you're worrying about God's already there. That meeting, that situation, that what's gonna happen tomorrow, God's already at that tomorrow. And so Peter's just like, I'm just gonna sleep. I'm just gonna hang out here. I'm not gonna go anywhere. And I wanna point out to you that Peter didn't escape, but he was delivered. When you escape something, it's you that does it. And some of us, we call escaping God moving, but we really manipulated the thing and we paid the thing and we figured it out and we twisted it. And whenever you escape something, you can get put back and locked back in it. But whenever God delivers you, God does it and it's done. It's the difference between being free and being free indeed. If you break out of jail, you're free, but you're forever looking over your shoulder because they're hunting you down. When you're free indeed, you don't look over your shoulder worrying if your yesterdays are gonna catch up with you in all your todays. Jesus said, whom the sun sets free is free indeed because he has cleared all of your yesterdays and the shame of yesterday will never have to catch up with you in all of your todays. Are you following me? He was delivered, he didn't escape. And here's what I just came to remind you, this one simple thing tonight is this, is that the same God the same God that got Peter out of prison because of a praying church is still the same God that responds to a praying church today. Did you hear me? The same God in the same way is still doing the supernatural. The same God that caused Jericho's walls to fall down is still taking down walls in our life today. And the same God that was cloud by day and fire by night is still giving guidance today. And the same God that caused 
David to take down a giant with a small stone is the same God that is removing the giants out of your life today. And the same God that put spit on dirt and put mud on eyes and is healing blinded eyes is still healing bodies today. And the same God that said, Lazarus, come out of that grave is the same God that is causing dead things in your life to resurrect today. The same God that caused Peter to get out of a prison because of a praying church is the same God that will respond to a praying church today. I came to tell you, Lakeshore, that he's still doing the supernatural, that he's still opening blinded eyes, that he's still resurrecting the dead, that he's still restoring marriages, that he's still bringing children back home, that he's still breaking addictions, that he's still giving directions. The same God he didn't quit in the New Testament. He's still doing it now. 